How's it going, American History 2 students? This is Mr. Bell coming back with another video lesson during this COVID-19 shutdown. This is COVID-19 shutdown day 39. This is originally your lesson for Thursday, May 21st, 2020. This is day 168 of 180. If this were a normal school year, of course it's not. Uh, I believe the last day for you guys during this school year, at least according to my calendar is going to be May 27th, so it's going to end a little earlier for you than it would be if we were having a normal school year. So normally we're trying to get to 180 up here, but for you guys it's going to end in the 170s, so that is one positive for you out of this. Let's go through the warm-up, then we're going to get into Unit 6, Part 3, which focuses on counterculture. This is stuff that is going back to our civil rights video lesson. What was SNCC? SNCC is the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. Uh, this is a group that used peaceful protests. People like John Lewis were members of it. Uh, they agreed with Dr. King's philosophies of civil disobedience and peaceful protest, but they pushed him to do more. Who radicalized SNCC? That was Stokely Carmichael radicalized SNCC, and they quickly became violent. Black power was on full display at the end of what world event? The 1968 Summer Olympics. Uh, the two men who displayed it are uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith with the famous black power symbol. So the first one is Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The second one is Stokely Carmichael. And the third one is the 1968 Summer Olympics, the Olympic Games. Who displayed it? Tommy Smith and John Carlos. So... Let's get into Unit 6, Part 3, which is counterculture. The main focus of this is society's reaction to all the tragic things, such as the assassinations of MLK, RFK, JFK, and Malcolm X, as well as the corruption of Richard Nixon and the tragedy of the Vietnam War. But before we get into counterculture, which is essentially the hippie movement and how that was reflected in society, there are a few political points and more uh, non-pop culture things that go with this. So, this is two parts, 6.5 and 6.6. .6. They're really, really short as far as individual sections of a notes packet. So I've just put them together into one video presentation so we can just go ahead and knock out Unit 6, which is why this is labeled Unit 6 Part 3, which is the end of Unit 6. Unit 6 Part 1 was Civil Rights, Part 2 was Vietnam, and Part 3 is Counterculture. One of the things that predated counterculture was this idea of the Great Society. Lyndon B. Johnson, before he declared war in Vietnam, he declared a war on poverty. He thought it was one of the things that had scourged the United States even after the safety nets that Franklin Roosevelt had put into place with the Great Depression. So what did the war on poverty mean? It was his push for a set of programs that he labeled as the Great Society. He would get this Great Society legislation passed through Congress. Now these things were originally JFK's ideas. They were called the New Frontier Program. Basically what Lyndon B. Johnson does is after JFK is assassinated, he takes the New Frontier Programs, renames them, rebrand them, as rebrands them as the Great Society, and th there's a lot to it. There's things like Pell Grants, funding for the arts, that type of thing, but the main thing that you see are going to be Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, things like WIC, food stamps, and many argue who are conservative that this encourages people uh, to not want to work, if you're more on the liberal side, you think it's a safety net that needs to be provided when people hit uh, the hardest of times in their life, especially when it comes to uh, young children. So depending on your political point of view, you will either view this as something as positive or something that is negative. So this is the Great Society. And again, there's a lot more to it. It focused a lot of money toward the arts and things of that nature as well, as well as money toward things like community college, giving more people access who maybe couldn't go straight to a four-year university. 
The feminist movement is part of this era, the women's liberation movement, and it was a movement led by NOW, or the National Organization of Women. There were two main faces of this women's rights movement. There were Gloria Steinem and Phyllis Shafley. Uh, they pushed for the Equal Rights Amendment, or the ERA. This would be an amendment that would be added to the Constitution that would say that women are viewed no differently than men in the eyes of the law, especially when it comes to employment. Many Every president from Truman through Reagan, actually, so Republicans and Democrats, tried to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. None were successful. The book The Feminine Mystique came out during this time. It was written by Betty Ferdinand, and it chronicled the sad life of a woman in mainly the 1950s. Uh, they were stay-at-home moms. They were not able to gain equal access to education, equal access to employment. They were seen as caretakers of the children and nothing more. And this is kind of an eye-opening thing for the rest of the country when they start to wake up and realize that not only women do they deserve more, but they want more, especially when it comes to careers. Roe versus Wade is a Supreme Court case that is infamous, uh, probably the most infamous Supreme Court case in American history. It legalized abortion. In other words, it gave women the right to choose. Uh, it created the notion of pro-choice, pro-choice being for abortion, pro-life being anti-abortion. Roe versus Wade legalized abortion. This was revisited in a 2000, I believe it was, it was either 03 or 06 case. Uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, where the Supreme Court upheld Roe versus Wade. So in the United States, it is legal, whether you agree or disagree, it's legal for a woman to gain access to an abortion. That being said, more conservative states have stricter guidelines on what it takes to perform these abortions. There was a big push for uh, Native American empowerment, kind, not retribution, but kind of a a payback for the injustices that had been done at the hands of uh, the colonists and presidents like Andrew Jackson. There was a movement known as the Red Power Movement, and it had leaders Clyde Belcourt and Russell Means. And it was one of the things that AIM, American Indian Movement, pushed for. And to gain attention to their cause, and mainly what they're wanting to do is to receive money payback from the federal government for the ancestors of people who were killed during horrific events like the Trail of Tears. They occupied Alcatraz, which had been decommissioned. It was no longer the famous prison in... My dog just came in here. It was no longer the famous prison in San Francisco, and they pushed for the Fort Lemire Treaty of 1868 to be honored, which basically gave them protection over certain Native American lands. There was also a push for uh, Hispanic rights at this time. Cesar Chavez led a union of farm workers. It calls for a boycott of grapes. You also had Corky Gonzalez, a uh, Mexican nationalist. But the big one here is La Raza Unida. They have the biggest impact. Uh, I'm not trying to demean like Caesar or Corky here, but Caesar Chavez being more famous than Corky Gonzalez. Uh, farmers, a lot of the farmers who were the grape farmers at this time were Hispanic, some legal, some illegal, and they were being vastly underpaid. And unfortunately, that still happens to this very day. Uh, La Raza United pushed for bilingual education. In other words, Spanish should be taught in schools. Believe it or not, English has never been officially declared the official language of the United States. So they push for students to have not just the opportunity, but the requirement to take a second language, usually at least two courses, as most of you are having to do right now, in order to graduate high school. The most common of which is uh, Spanish, the second most common of which is French. Some schools uh, offer more languages to learn than this. Uh, the environment. Lyndon B. Johnson was the first president to really focus on the environment with the Clean Air Act. It limited the amount of pollution that plants could put out into the air. Uh, this cost some jobs, but it protected the environment. 
and it kind of solidified this notion of Democrats being the party that pushed for environmental protection. They're more environmentalists than Republicans. Although it is Nixon who uh, cl- who actually creates the EPA, who is a Nixon, who is a Republican, the Environmental Protection Agency, which regulates companies and regulates citizens in regards to the environment and the pollution they can put out. Uh, a lot of this was pushed for after a, the Love Canal incident, which was a toxic waste dumping site that was uncovered near Niagara Falls in New York, going into Canada. Uh, that had mutated a lot of the marine life and killed a lot of it. So, that is part one of Unit 6, part three. We're going to move into uh, the counterculture, the music, the movies, the TV, just the attitudes that people had uh, kind of rising out of those assassinations in the Vietnam War, as I mentioned at the top of this video. Music became more than just something that people listen to to pass the time. And music was influenced by an influx of British bands who became popular in the United States, the British Invasion, uh, like the Stones, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, groups like that. And the real change in music comes from it not just being entertainment, but having a political, a social, and a historical purpose. There are meaning behind the words that are being uh, written and, and sang at this time by these musical artists. And they are commenting on things like the Vietnam War and how society feels oppressed as far as African Americans are concerned. And there's really a lot of this music pushes our country to get along, peace and love, which is kind of the motto of counterculture. Uh, radio begins to play music after years of playing just the news and uh, radio plays, things like Superman, Little Orphan Annie. Fashion becomes more colorful. Uh, men grow beards. They grow their hair out. That kind of clean cut look of the 1950s is over. Uh, and this is all kind of done in reaction to this feeling of apathy toward a society, specifically in America, who had sent a generation of young people to die for what they considered uh, something that was pointless in the Vietnam War. Now, post this, in the mid-70s, disco and more meaningless music, as far as not as much of a spiritual message to it, uh, would become popular. Andy Warhol is the biggest artist of the time. You know his uh, his paintings. I'll show you one real quick here. And once you see them, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's usually the four colorful faces, like right there. There's the Marilyn Monroe when he did in 1964. And, of course, this has been spoofed. You saw, you see the Trump ones here. So that's Andy Warhol. <coughs> TV. So TV became something that was more entertainment than it was providing news for people, much like the radio. And edgier TV shows came about and the first to really push the envelope as far as making fun of the president commenting on politics telling more crude jokes was Saturday Night Live which is still on NBC to this day uh, former radio shows like The Long Ranger and Gunsmoke go live action uh, game shows like Jeopardy Will of Fortune become very popular uh, now Jeopardy was later, but I said like that, game shows that would influence that. Uh, Hollywood, as far as movies, become more genre-oriented. So instead of uh, just westerns, you see uh, science fiction and horror and things of that nature. Rather than cookie cutter, good versus evil, you see more gray characters portrayed on the screen. TV dinners see a rise in popularity as Americans want to sit by their TV and watch the latest entertainment while they eat after a long day at work. Counterculture. So here are some people that are considered to be counterculture. There's beatniks and there's hippies. Uh, beatniks is a term coined by Allen Ginsberg and others. Uh, and they spoke out against conformity, they embraced drugs, they embraced sexuality, uh, they were not big on abstinence. But that was kind of the early hippies. They were hippies that were not fully evolved. 
Hippies are similar to beatniks, but they were more outspoken even than beatniks about how they were apathetic toward a society that they perceived didn't care about them. Many died to the Vietnam draft. Many refused to work. Many just traveled the country in the buses and vans like you see here and uh, just followed bands like the Grateful Dead. Uh, the event, as far as counterculture was defined, was Woodstock, a huge music festival in 1969. The who's who of the uh, scene, the music scene, was on display in full force here. People like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, just to name a few uh, legendary artists that were there. They did. It was a free music festival at the height of the Vietnam War. They didn't account for how many people would show up, so they didn't have enough porta johns, so sanitation quickly went by the wayside. There was rain showers that they didn't have a lot of the stage equipment covered for, and there were storms that, that hit New York uh, those three days that the festival took place. So there was lightning that struck the stage equipment. There were some uh, dangerous uh, conditions to see music in. High Ashbury became the hippie and drug capital of the world, and San Francisco is still there, but it's more of a touristy destination now. As far as the workplace, you have three terms coined, blue collar, white collar, pink collar. Now, two of these are still prevalent, right? But one is not pink collar, referred to women in the workplace. That's something we accept and is common now. In fact, many women are the breadwinners, like my wife being a nurse. Blue collar refers to uh, manual label type jobs, things like welding. It doesn't mean you're making less money. It just means you're working more with your hands, whereas white collar is a more 9 to 5 desk type of job. So that's going to wrap it up for Unit 6, Part 3, and it wraps up Unit 6 overall, ending with counterculture. Uh, stay safe if you have any questions about this lesson or anything else regarding American History 2. Email me at bsbell at clevelandcountyschools.org. Thank you. Have a great day.